Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be here in person to be with you, but I will be on the, uh, on the conference call to answer questions uh, later on. Um, so as you've heard from uh, Christiana and Anthony, we've, we're gathered here to look at an oil study, a study on oil markets that we've done coming out of the work that Carbon Tracker has uh, pioneered in the last two to three years around carbon budgets and how they interact with the finance sector. And in this case, we really want to take the analysis down from a carbon budget to the reality of the supply and demand uh, curves in oil markets so that investors can really think about what's going on live today in relation to policies as they stand and policies as they might emerge. And therefore, we're going to be looking at demand uh, scenarios, stress testing, most importantly, the supply curves where different amounts of oil enter the markets and how they relate to the car how they relate to carbon. Very importantly at the end, we tie this to capital expenditures because what we really want to focus on is how would investors really have a dialogue with companies about the higher priced, very high carbon content uh, projects and locations around the world uh, in relation to uh, their capital expenditure that might be required and the sort of costs that they're running into. And in that sense, be able to, to say, do you really believe that it's worth bringing these projects online? Or do you think you should think about it and maybe manage your capital differently, could include returns to shareholders. So that's really the, the big picture overview of what we're trying to do. So in relation to that, we really have six key takeaways, which you can see on the first slide here. Basically, we start from the fact there is, a, there is a two degree carbon budget context, which is the carbon tracker context that, uh, that has been put forward in the last two to three years. Um, the fact is we want to show that the private sector overall really has a pivotal role in developing oil between now and 2050, uh, which is the key target for the two degree climate world. And that if we stress test the logic of upstream capital expenditure on oil, you know, d does it make sense uh, to develop a lot of that oil just in pure economics terms? Then we're going to introduce this notion of this carbon supply cost curve, which is the way we see that we bridge this, this gap between the carbon world and the economics world, where we express supply in oil a million barrels a day, we convert that into carbon. A simple concept, but I think you're very useful. Then we focus on the idea of what projects do look in today's uh, environment, uh, potentially expensive, potentially risky. And this is really a risk analysis for investors. And then we will have a look at how that exposure relates to companies, uh, including major companies, and look at that importantly by the key locations where these very high carbon, high cost uh, uh, projects lie. So again, if we now turn to slide two, what we can see here, first of all, is that over the period of 2014 to 2050, we look at the breakdown between the whole world, global oil production and carbon supply, uh, the nas national oil companies, the private sector, and within the private sector, the majors. And I think the seven major oil companies, that is. I think that what's interesting is you'll see immediately the global oil budget, if we from a, a carbon tracker perspective, if you take a 900 gigaton uh, carbon budget, which is what the carbon tracker has talked about, and you just allow oil to have 40% of that, its current share, you get to about 360 gigatons of a so-called budget. Um, you can see that globally we will blow through that by 2050 quite significantly, and the private sector is pretty close to supplying the whole of it anyway. Um, so, and the majors are important, um, within that. So you can see the context that we're starting off with, that there is a lot of oil technically in the ground. And I want to mention that what we're talking about here is really poten potential production based on oil resources. We're not talking about some narrow definition of reserves. This is a long-run study of potential supply and production coming from, from the full resource uh, uh, availability. Um, so please take it in that context. Now what we can also see is that if you actually add the partly listed national oil companies to the private companies, then you really do get, you know, something like 65% of potential oil is coming out from private or, or partly listed national oil companies. And that's why investors, we think, can, can be important in the dialogue. 
So then moving on to slide three, what we can see is that we did stress test the following major oil demand scenarios. We obviously start with the IEA, their new policy scenario, which is really the base for what most, an, most uh, analysts tend to use, unless they use business as usual, but IEA new policy is well, well used. Then you have the more climate oriented demand scenarios, which is the 450 parts per million to 2035, and the so-called two degree scenario out to 2050. And there the IEA uses uh, carbon prices and uh, to high levels and more uh, aggressive policy responses to get to those sorts of levels. Then we also always have to look at what the oil majors think, BP, Shell, Exxon, they do publish their views. And then I think we like to explore the notion of down downside drivers. You know, will energy efficiency, lower growth in China and emerging economies, technology shifts, will these actually bring about potentially weaker oil uh, demand and therefore prices in the market might think. So that's a starting point in terms of demand and we spend a fair bit of time going through that. Turning to slide uh, four, well, this is introducing, if you like, a full supply curve at break-even oil prices. Now, a break-even oil price basically says, is this project economic at this particular at a particular oil price that would make the uh, NPV of that project equal to zero at a 10 percent rate uh, discount rate. Um, bit technical, but that's what's going on. So you can get the idea that this is a price at which companies of an oil price company say, well, maybe these projects make sense. And therefore you get a supply curve going up all the way through millions of barrels of production and we can then convert that into carbon production. That's the carbon supply cost curve. One thing we need to also introduce, though, is that most companies will not just take that break-even price, they'll probably add a contingency, a contingency to the oil price, just in case, they're not quite sure. And we have used a $15 contingency, which has been used by others in the market, including Rystad, um, whose data this is based on. I should say that this, all this data comes from the Rystad U-Cube um, database, uh, which is a well-known uh, oil, oil supply database. So what you can see is the sort of supply curves at different prices. And once again, we do point out here that the oil budget, so-called, is actually satisfied at around $60 break even, which would be around 75 in terms of market prices. At that point, in a sense, everything up to there is somewhat climate secure. Once you get over that level, it becomes more questionable in terms of the climate. But we think for investors, the focus really starts at around $80 break even, $95 in the market, because that's the price getting closer to current market prices that we think oil companies start to stress test their assumptions of whether they're really going to go ahead and produce. We now look at slide five, which looks at the key break-even prices by key producer. And again, I'd remind if you want to add $15 mentally, do you get to the market price? So once again, focused over $80 break-even oil price as the key level, what we see is that globally there are 29 million barrels per day potentially of oil production at yielding 185 gigatons of carbon. And again, the private sector has potentially 22 million barrels per day yielding 135 gigatons of carbon. So therefore, we say again, the private sector really has a key role to play at these higher price levels. We also note that OPEC and the oil majors have significant supply at lower price levels. Turning on to slide six, we break this down into what oil analysts uh, would like always do, conventional versus unconventional. We start to look at the different oil types, which we think is very important. So again, here we're looking at conventional oil, and within that, actually, that is where the Arctic and deep water lies. And it's really these two areas, over $80 break even, that really are significant. What we've got is 26 gigatons of deep and ultra deep water over $80, which is 4 million barrels per day. And in the Arctic, 9 gigatons or 1.4 million barrels per day. And when you look at the break evens of the Arctic, they are very high indeed. Um, and then also in deep water, you have very, very high priced oil. So one would expect anyone wanting to develop these is really betting on a very significant increase in the oil price. And the question is, is that really going to come? And I think that's a really valid question for investors to engage companies that are, that, that are placing uh, money into those, uh, those areas.
So if we now move on to slide seven, we can look at the unconventional oil categories, and particularly there, oil sands is very dominant. Over $80 break even, we've got 16 gigatons, and we've got 2.2 million barrels a day. So oil sands are truly a very significant part of uh, what we would consider to be expensive high carbon uh, oil development. It's also noticeable though that both uh, oil shale, uh, oil shale in particular does feature and does extra heavy oil, other types of heavy oil, but the oil sands really do tend to stand out in unconventional. So now what we do on slide eight, we start to really to, to start to focus on capital expenditure. Because what we've said is, okay, we've established where the high cost, high carbon content uh, sort of categories of oil are. What about the capital expenditure associated with those, again, by these key break-even prices? Well, here what we do in these particular charts, we're going to look at capital expenditure in real terms all the way from now to 2050. So, you know, you would expect some fairly big numbers, uh, but you get them. So indeed, deep and ultra deep water will have to uh, use seven trillion dollars to get that capex to capital expenditures to get to, uh, to get to get that production in shape. And the Arctic needs two point eight trillion dollars. So these are large numbers over the next thirty five years or so, um, and that's the question: How risky is that type of a number? If we turn on slide nine. Uh, to the unconventional, again, oil sands comes in at uh, 1.2 trillion. That might sound a little lower, but of course, you know, these capital expenditures are different depending on the different technologies. But in oil sand, it's still a significant number. And you can also see that both shale and heavy, e extra heavy in terms of their capex is also fairly significant, over 700 billion, oil sands coming in at 1.2 trillion. So again, fairly large amounts of capital expenditure to be spent. So now we really turn, in a sense, finally, to, in terms of my analysis, uh, to the last slide, slide 10, and we say, okay, having seen all of that, where is this happening? You know, if you're an investor, okay, you've now realized there's a lot of money at stake, there's a lot of carbon at stake, in, at stake if you're interested in that as well, um, and, and these things are high priced, you know, where should you be looking? And what we find here is, interesting enough, when we break it down by key geographic locations uh, within the Reistad database, this turns out to be key provinces um, within countries, uh, what we find is the top 10 provinces really account for over 90% of the capital expenditure. But what we do here is we now narrow the capital expenditure focus to the next 10 to 12 years, 2014 to 2025, even though we do show the carbon production still all the way out to 2050, because that's ultimately over time what this will unlock. But we think in the shorter run, people are going to be more interested in focusing down on what's going on in the next decade in terms of discussions with companies. And of course, what we see again is oil sands in Alberta extremely dominant. Um, you know, the, it, it is a, just such a key area um, for capital expenditure and carbon. After that, again, the deep water, Gulf Coast US, Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Mexico deep water, Rio Janeiro deep water, if we look further down the Atlantic Ocean. Then we also see, so the deep water's there, we also see Western Siberia coming in um, in terms of, of that. Uh, area, and we also see the Caspian Sea uh, as also very important as well. So, and then finally, on the in the top ten, the Barentis Sea in terms of Arctic also starts to show up. So, this I think allows investors to start to get more granular. Now, the the talk after this is going to come from James Leeton, who will then take you down to map the different company exposures. Um, to these key locations in terms of their capital expenditure so that then we move from the location level through to the company level. So to conclude, what we've done in this study, we've started in the really high level of carbon budgets, carbon supply, uh, oil supply, brought that down through the different types of producers, through the different types, through the private sector, then taking that down to the different types of oil, 
taking that down to the capital expenditure, taking that down to the provinces, and then we will see how that ends up in the companies. And we believe and hope that this is a useful tool for people to think about the challenges, the risk to capital expenditure, the risk in oil markets, the different demand scenarios that we go through in great detail um, that may bring oil to lower prices and challenge these break-evens. Uh, and therefore, we believe that this is a good opportunity for investors to engage in discussions around capital management with companies. So on that note, I will now pass over to James Leeton. Thank you.